we have small wars now, and historically small wars somehow or another wind up turning into big wars. We would think that people would learn the lessons of history, but they never do. I don't like the sides that I see. I would like to think that we're smart enough to, to stay away from war, but Michelle, mankind has never been smart enough to avoid wars. Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. Thank you for joining us. The soft landing narrative is gaining traction. BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, has turned bullish on U.S. stocks, upgrading them to overweight from neutral on expectations that the U.S. economy is set for a soft landing. Fitch Ratings has revised its outlook for the U.S. economy, no longer predicting a recession this year due to what it says are emerging signs of economic strength. This is the same Fitch that downgraded the U.S. government's credit rating last year. And many banks are calling for a soft landing and no recession as well, including Morgan Stanley, Bank of America and UBS. Goldman and JP Morgan forecast 2024 real GDP growth of around 2%. And U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen thinks that a recession this year is not probable. She was touting the economy during a recent stop in Milwaukee. Well, here to give us his macroeconomic outlook and his thoughts on a range of topics is legendary investor Jim Rogers. Jim is the co-founder of the Quantum Fund, along with George Soros. He's the chairman of Rogers Holdings and b Interests and the creator of the Rogers International Commodities Index. He's also a best-selling author, amongst many of his other credentials. It's great to have you back with us, Jim. I am delighted to be here, Michelle, and I'm delighted to hear all those people say there's no recession. So now I know there will be a recession. (laughs) Well, that's what we have you here for, to give us the contrarian take. So what is your macro outlook? You're disagreeing with all of those uh, big banks and experts. Break it down for us. Well, I don't mind disagreeing with all those experts, certainly not. But it's been, you know, at the longest in American history that we've gone without a recession. It's a very long time doesn't mean it has to go, we have to have a recession, but we always have. And I see the various signs that something is going to go wrong soon. I mean, we see everybody thinking the same way. We think a lot of new investors coming in who think that this is easy and fun to make money. So, I mean, all the signs are there. Maybe it won't happen this time, but it always has, Michelle. Right. And I know that you have warned that the next time is going to be the worst time, the worst crash that you would ever witness in your lifetime. But it seems as though that can just gets kicked further and further down the road. I mean, what do you make of that? I mean, when we look at the data, um, and again, this is government data, which is mostly government spending. But in terms of a traditional definition of a recession, We're having fourth quarter growth of 3.3 increase and a traditional recession definition is two quarters of negative growth. So, you know, by by the GDP data, it does not look like a recession is imminent. What do you make of that? Well, that was last year. I thought we were talking about 2024 and 25. That's when I... Okay, so go on. You still think we'll see a, a big GDP turn in the next year or so? Uh, yes, I uh, suspect we will. I mean, uh, I have to watch, you know, Kitco to find out what's happening. But of course, no, the signs are rising that we're going to have problems again. And, you know, in 2008, we had a big problem. But Michelle, since 2008 and 2009, the debt everywhere has skyrocketed. So the next recession, my view is the next recession has to be worse the worst in my lifetime because the debt is so very much high, higher now than it has been ever before in my lifetime. Who knows? I'll watch Kitco to find out. But I know the debt has skyrocketed. Even China has a lot of debt now. You know, China bailed us out in 2008, but even China's got debt. Not everybody has debt. Well, maybe North Korea doesn't have debt, but everybody else has a lot of debt. So it's got to be bad. So what is the trigger here then? What do you think happens to put us in this recession and turn things around? Well, 
the way these things work is they it always starts in some place that no one pays attention to. In 2007, you know, Iceland went bankrupt. Well, most people didn't know there was an Iceland, much less that it could go bankrupt. But then over the next several months, things got worse and worse. Bear Stearns went bankrupt. Lehman went bankrupt. And then everybody knew something was wrong. That's the way it usually works. Uh, so far, we've had a few minor problems in the world. Uh, nothing major yet. But when... When it's major and it's on the evening news, then we all know. Well, I would argue that uh, the world is looking very volatile and very precarious at the moment, Jim, with so many geopolitical flashpoints and tensions, and least of which uh, the uncertainty of over 60 elections taking place this year. Obviously, we've got the Russia-Ukraine war going on still. We've got the Israel-Hamas war and the potential spillover that that's already starting to have with other Iranian-backed proxies in Yemen shooting into the Red Sea. Now we also have the situation um, in Jordan where three American troops were killed, also believed to be attributed to Iran. So a lot of geopolitical flashpoints, do you see that as something that potentially triggers the, the reversal here? You see, that's why I said you should watch Kid Code News. <laughs> You know, you know what's going on, uh, and I know what's going I think I know what's going on. I see all the same problems developing that you see, but so far none of them has been big enough to cause us to have a serious problem. And so far, you know, central banks have very loose policies. If you go to Tokyo, my gosh, you can't believe how much money the Japanese central bank is printing and spending and borrowing. And that's true of other central banks as well. So there's a lot of money around at the moment. And I don't know what's going to cause it to stop and when it's going to stop. But I know it is. And I know many of the signs that I have seen before are starting to develop. I'm not selling, I'm not selling short yet. No, 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 no. I'm not, I don't see the bear market starting this afternoon. Mm -hmm. But I can see signs that it's coming. Let's talk about those signs. What are you seeing? Well, first of all, everybody, you just told me everybody thinks that this is okay, that everything is okay now, that even you see lots of good things happening, and I see, I see those things happening too. You see lots of new investors coming in. They call up their friends and say, oh, I've discovered this new thing called the stock market, and you can make money, and it's fun, and it's easy. It's easy to make money. You know, all of these things have happened before. You have a narrower, a narrow band of stocks that are always going up. I mean, I've seen this rodeo before. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the first sign. Like Warren Buffett says, be fearful when others are greedy. And there's a little bit too much irrational exuberance in the markets, to quote Alan Greenspan there. Is, is that your first indicator that everybody's telling you it's going to be fine? That's when you know it's not. Well, I can watch Kitco News and find out what people are well, thinking. You have explained it very carefully. Well, people are clearly. watching. Thank you, Jim. But people are watching to get your take on the matter. I'm just trying to summarize your views here. But you mentioned the debt, and that is obviously a huge issue. $34 trillion in debt. It's one of the top concerns in terms of long-term economic stability. So much so that J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, he recently warned about the economy heading towards a financial crisis due to this escalating national debt. He warned of a looming hockey stick surge in debt, and he added that when it starts, markets around the world will rebel because foreigners own $7 trillion of U.S. government debt. But he said that the situation is like driving towards a cliff at a high speed if debt levels are not addressed. And I'm quoting him, it's a cliff, we see the cliff, it's about 10 years out. We're going 60 miles an hour. So it's that 10 years out part that I want you to weigh in on. You clearly agree that the issue is there. Do you see the timeline as far out as 10 years as Jamie Dimon thinks? Uh, I mean, Jamie is a smart guy, but I don't see it holding up, up for another 10 years. I mean, that's 2034. I promise you, Michelle, we're going to have a big bear market before 2034, and it's going to be extremely serious. The good news is, Michelle, 
you have job security because somebody has to report it. <laughs> None of the rest of us have job security, but, but you do because you have to tell us what's going on. Well, don't know about that, Jim, but we want you to tell the people how they can then prepare for this. Okay, so you're saying that the 10-year timeline is not your timeline. You expect it sooner. Now, I grant it, it's very hard to time these things, but are you expecting this to come crashing in in half that time, in five years' time, before that? Give me, give me an approximate I timeline. It be before five years, certainly before 10 years, probably before two, five years, maybe even this year. Um, uh, this year is an election year, as you pointed out, in many countries, mm -hmm. and politicians always want to keep people happy. So politicians around the world are going to be doing their best to make us all happy and keep economies strong and stock markets strong. But there comes a time when it gets out of control and not even the central bankers or the stockbrokers or anybody can control them. And I'm afraid that I see the signs that we're getting not, not there yet, but I see the signs that that will probably come in the next year or so. All right. So this biggest crash in your lifetime beginning in the next year or so? This debt coming? I'll watch but... Gitco to find out when it's going to start. But yes, that's probably correct. All right. Well, let's talk about some of those signs because uh, many would argue that the Magnificent Seven is a big glaring indicator here. Uh, the overvaluation of many of these stocks and the fact that you have such a few stocks really propping up the markets, taking the Dow and the S&P 500 to uh, new all-time highs, and much of that is driven by these seven companies, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Tesla. Um, you've said in previous interviews that they're overvalued and ripe for a shorting. Are you looking at shorting any of them now, or what would you be looking for? Well, those are on my list to short because, as you point out, those are the ones that are being exploited. Those are the ones that have very high valuations. I'm not sure in any of them yet, but they're high on my list in previous bear markets. If you look back at the stocks that were really, really hot before the bear market began, those are the stocks that go down the most. I yeah. mean, this is simple market history. I'm not, I'm not telling you something that you don't know. I hope you already know, but no, that's the way the markets work. Whatever's hot, in one bear mar in one bull market becomes very cold when the bear market comes. All right. So if you do think this bear market approacheth, winter is coming, how are you positioning yourself? You're not shorting yet, but how are you positioning yourself right now? Well, at the moment, I have a lot of cash, and the cash is in U.S. dollars mainly. I have other currencies, but mainly U.S. dollars because, you know, everybody— I mean, the U.S. dollar is not a sound currency anymore. We're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. But everybody thinks it's a sound currency, and they think it's a safe haven. So when problems come, people race to a safe haven. They think it'll be the U.S. dollar. I would suspect the U.S. dollar will go up, will get overpriced. I hope if it happens that way that I'm smart enough to sell it. Your question should now be, Michelle, but where will you put the money? And I don't know. I don't know what currency is going to compete with the U.S. dollar in the future. Obviously, logically, it should be the Chinese renminbi, but the renminbi is a blocked currency. You cannot have a blocked currency as the world's major mar ma uh, currency. So I don't know. I'm looking. What are your thoughts on a potential yet-to-be-created currency if we're to believe what's coming out of the BRICS and this common currency that they're working on backed by a basket of commodities or predominantly gold? Do you see this as a reality that could happen soon? Well, it's a wonderful idea. Yes, yes, yes. But, I, and who knows, but I don't see those countries... And it's not all five of them that are jumping in yet. Yeah. Uh, I don't see those countries as having the economic power, except China, to do something. But as I said, China's got a blocked currency right now. So I don't, I don't see it. So you don't see the BRICS plus, BRICS have expanded, adding new members. You don't see them successfully launching a commodity-backed common currency anytime soon. I think it's a fantastic idea, but there's a difference in an idea and an execution. All right. So still staying in dollars because you haven't quite found 
the alternative in terms of currency. What about gold? Well, I own gold. I own silver. I have for many years. I've never sold any gold or silver. Don't plan to. I hope that my children have my gold and silver someday. But yes, historically, gold and silver have been refuges in times of problems. And I'm an old peasant, Michelle. Us <laughs> old peasants want to have some gold in the closet and some under silver the bed, under Jim. the bed. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, you know, look under my bed. You'll find some silver. Look in my closet. You'll find some gold. I'm an old peasant. And we know, us peasants know how to protect ourselves. They always have some physical gold and silver in the grab and go bag. But Jim, are you adding to those gold and silver positions at the moment? I haven't added recently, but if and when they go down a lot, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. If I were buying one right now and I'm not, it would be silver because silver is down 60% from its all time high. Gold is at an all time high. So on a historic basis anyway, silver is cheaper. Right. And maybe and I'll buy some tomorrow. I mean, who knows? Well, are you going to buy some silver tomorrow? We want to know. I, I doubt it, but who knows? Okay, well, why do you think silver is uh, not catching up to gold? Well, I don't have an idea. Um, come on, you're Kitco News. Kitco's a specialist. You know everything about the metals, the precious metals. That's because um, we talk to experts like you, Jim. Well, I'm not sure why silver hasn't uh, kept up. Um, it is a little perplexing, but that usually means there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And unless there's some something I don't know, and it's often something I don't know, but unless there's something I don't know specific to silver now, I don't know why silver is not. These things happen in markets. They've been happening for hundreds of years, and they will continue to happen. So maybe tomorrow I'll go buy some silver. All right, you'll let me know if you do, Jim. Now, Jim, something that you did know about was inflation, because when you joined me in early 2021, we discussed inflation, and you said, Michelle, brace for inflation, that there is absolutely no way that all the stimulus doesn't result in a surge in inflation, even though Jerome Powell was trying to assure us that inflation was transitory. As we know, we did get inflation. We had it a four-decade high recently. We're being told, Jim, that inflation is cooling, that it's rising at a slower pace. We had PCE rising moderately in December, keeping the annual increase in inflation below 3% now for the third straight month. Do you think the Fed is able to successfully tame this inflation problem? I don't have much confidence in the, our, the U.S. central bank or any central bank. The U.S. has had a couple of good central banks in the past hundred odd years. Uh, India had a good central bank chairman once, but most central bankers are bureaucrats and academics. They, they're just trying to keep their job, Michelle. They don't know what they're doing. And the way markets work, you said inflation is down a little bit. Well, that's markets go up, they correct, they go up, they correct. This is the way markets always work. And that's what's happening with inflation now. We're having a normal correction. I would suspect that we will see more inflation later this year. So you expect inflation to rise if the Fed starts to cut rates? Oh, especially if the Fed cuts rates. You know, historically, when the Fed starts cutting rates, markets go down because they know, oh, that's what we've been waiting for. You buy on the rumor, you sell on the news. Mm. So that's normally when the central banks start cutting rates. That's when markets go down, at least for a while. So then when the Fed starts to cut, that's A, when you expect equity markets to start to turn. But you, regardless, you think inflation is, is going up? Michelle, central banks all around the world have printed unbelievable amounts of money in the last few years, a couple of years, huge amounts of money. Uh, as I said, Japan, the central banker goes to work early every morning because he's a good central banker, good Japanese, and cranks up the printing presses. Can't believe how much money they're printing in Japan and other countries. Maybe yeah. the U.S. has slowed down for a while, but Michelle, when things start going wrong, if they start going wrong or when they start going wrong, in Washington, they're going to print more money. That's all they know. They right. don't know what else to do. And, and to that point, Jim, 
Last time we spoke, I asked you how viewers can protect against inflation, and you said buy commodities, which, you know, makes sense. Uh, and you specifically said that one couldn't go wrong with the, the RJI Commodities Index, the Rogers International Commodity Index. Um, it is down about 3.5% from a year ago. Since the start of 2020, uh, it's up around 50%. Other commodity index tracking funds also down year over year. The um, Invesco one down around 9.5%. iShares down um, also around uh, 1% from a year ago. United States Commodity Index Fund down, oh, that one is up 3% from a year ago. But for the most part, we're not seeing commodities act in the way they should, with the exception of gold a little bit. Why do you think that is? Well, that's a very, very good question, and I don't have a good answer. Uh, I'm optimistic about gold and silver and other commodities, as I explained before. Uh, I have no idea why silver is down so much. Uh, as, as in the, uh, you should watch Kitco, for goodness sakes. Tell, you can tell me why <laughs> silver is down. But it is down nearly 60% from its all-time high. That's not a bubble. I assure you, that's not a bubble. Maybe gold is a bubble. I doubt it, but maybe. But silver is certainly not a bubble. All right, well, let's focus on the agricultural sector because you've long been a proponent of that. Since the day I met you, Jim, you told me to marry a farmer. <laughs> I'm still working on that, by the way. You said buy a farm or marry a farmer, learn how to drive a tractor. Still working on all of the above. Uh, but you've often said that agriculture is a great bet, that it's been very depressed, that you see great opportunities there. And, you know, it would make sense. When I pay for things at the grocery store, my bill reflects that prices have gone up, right? But then I look at these agricultural ETFs and the picture isn't reflected the same there. The, the cow iShares Global Agricultural uh, in Index ETF down 15% year over year. The Mu Van Eck Agri Business ETF down 21% from a year ago. I don't understand this, Jim, because I go to the grocery store, the prices that I pay there have dramatically increased. And I'm buying the things that these agricultural funds are growing or invested in growing. Why the disconnect? Can you explain that well, to me? That's an extremely good question. And I don't have a good answer, uh, except that at times when people are looking for cash, they sell whatever they can sell. And since agriculture has been reasonably strong, down it's down now, but compared to what it could have been, I, all I can answer is people are selling it because they need, they want to raise money, but I don't have a good answer. Would you still support the idea of invest, investing in an agriculture ETF, investing in farming in one way or another? Michelle, I know your parents taught you to buy low and sell high. You just explained that agriculture is low. So yes, you should be, I mean, I cannot tell people what to do, but agriculture is probably a good investment opportunity in 2024. Well, you know who thinks it is? It's Bill Gates, because uh, he's been the number one buyer of farmland in the United States. That's raising quite a few questions about the amount of farmland that Bill Gates owns. Uh, in a book by Seamus Bruner called Control Garx, the author and, and, and investigative journalist takes a look at that. And Bill Gates and other billionaires are pushing for patented fertilizers, fake meat, and buying up big chunks of U.S. farmland. And at the end of 2022, in an Ask Me Anything event on Reddit, Gates admitted that he owns about 270,000 acres of farmland spread across 18 states. So by his own admission, that's a little more than one third of the state of Rhode Island. That's a big amount of farmland there. So... As of 2022, uh, that's what Bill Gates owns. What do you make of that? Well, as I had just explained, I think that's probably a wise investment. Certainly, you know, 10, 20 years from now, somebody's going to look back and say, wow, he was really smart. You know, whether he's buying it in the U.S. or Australia or where, Canada, wherever it is, they're probably good investments, you know, Agriculture has not been a great investment for a while. And as I said before, I know your parents taught you to buy low and sell high. Maybe Mr. Gates knows what he's doing. It's certainly low. Is there any cause for concern 
with all of this farmland being centralized under one individual or a few individuals? Well, I'm not concerned, but if you are, by all means, write your congressman. But I'm not concerned, no. But uh, all right, that doesn't concern you, that small independent farms are sort of being uh, conglomerated into bigger farm holdings? Well, unfortunately, small independent farms have usually not been terribly competitive. They've not been great investments, good, great places for agriculture to be produced or anything else, it usually, history shows that if you can roll up or make big farms, you're probably going to be more successful. Right, um, and you know, you talk about history and one of the lines that you often say, that I often quote you on, is that the greatest lesson of history is that people don't learn the lessons of history. So yes. as we are here, Jim, with again, broadening our discussion into geopolitics here. Where we are in the world right now, as we discussed, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Middle East tensions escalating, elections around the world, uh, China's economy looking a little shaky. What's your read on where we are in this moment of history? Well, unfortunately, if you go back to previous periods of history, we have small wars now, and historically, small wars somehow or another wind up turning into big wars. It's not good. We would think that people would learn the lessons of history, but they never do. And so when I say, if you go back to before World War I, this is the sort of thing that started happening in small wars. And the next, you know, in, as recently as, say, 1912, the German and British royal families vacation together, party together, et cetera, et cetera. And a couple of years later, they were slaughtering each other in the trenches. So these things can change and do change. And I, I don't like the signs that I see. I would like to think that we're smart enough to, to stay away from war, but Michelle, mankind has never been smart enough to avoid wars. Do you shooting think wars, shooting wars. A kinetic war, do you think that we're on the precipice of an even bigger escalation in terms of global conflict? I see the signs are moving in that direction. I have no idea what's going to happen. I would hope that all of us, mankind, would be smart enough to know, let's not do that again, because it's never been good for anybody, but we will see. Uh, hopefully, we will not see. <laughs> hopefully, this won't transpire. <laughs> but given that you are, are a great student of history and have insight on many things, including China, very bullish on China, uh, we'll get your position on China's economy, but you certainly are very familiar with China. I want to get your thoughts on what we've been hearing from President Xi. He has said that reunification with Taiwan is inevitable. And the analysts are speculating that if he was going to make this move into Taiwan, that from his perspective, this is an ideal time. With what is perceived as a weak and chaotic Biden administration, those conflicts around the world that we just discussed, Russia, Ukraine, Middle East tensions, um, escalating not only with Israel and Hamas, but as we mentioned, other Iranian-backed proxies, um, a lot of distraction around the world. And then, of course, we have elections. And the U.S. is more divided than ever before. These elections set up to be the most contentious than ever before. And analysts are speculating that if there was going to be any military action into Taiwan from China, this is the window. And potentially around October, November, at the height of election tension and distraction. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I, would, I can look at a globe and I know that Taiwan's going to be part of China again someday. I don't know when the someday is, unfortunately, but if I were China and I'm not, they certainly don't listen to me. I would just wait because, I mean, Michelle, look at your globe. There's no way that Taiwan cannot be part of China someday, and it will be. Will it be by war? I hope not. China seems to be smart enough to just wait because they know it's going to be theirs again someday. And I hope they will just wait. Um, the U.S. keeps 
antagonizing. You know, Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan. American politicians keep going to Taiwan. I mean, they're poking, poking the Chinese in the face. I wish they wouldn't. I wish, because, but so far, China just seems to be patient, and I hope that will continue. Uh, I have, I don't know the people in Beijing, so I have no idea what they're going to do. All right, you have no insight there, but you do feel that China will. Well, I have be- insights, but who knows if they're right? I don't have any inside information. Right. I don't speak to the people in the Chinese government. But you don't see that timing happening this year, according to your personal insight. My personal insights, no, I do not see it happening now. But again, I have, I don't speak Chinese, I don't read Chinese, so I, there's a lot that I probably don't know. But I know your daughters speak Mandarin, because that was a big part of the reason why you moved to Singapore. Um, but let's talk about China's economy then, because you have been a longtime bull on China. We're seeing the property market there take several hits uh, just this week. We have Hong Kong ordering the liquidation of China Evergrande. China's facing many challenges, the real estate crisis, deflation, export decline, high youth unemployment, lowered birth rates, uh, even official GDP is down, and many argue that that is manipulated data to begin with. What's your outlook on China's economy? Well, my view has been, as you, as I think you know, for 30 or 40 years, that China was on the rise again. I mean, now everybody knows it. Now I'm not the only one. I was ridiculed back in the old era. I remember in the 80s, I would come back and say, China, 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 and everybody would say, no, 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 Japan, Japan, Japan. You may remember, you're not old enough to remember those days, but China has certainly risen dramatically. Now it's the second largest or maybe largest economy in the world, depending on who's measuring and it's going to continue. But Michelle, if you look at the United States, we had some horrible setbacks in the last 100, 150 years as we were rising to become the most successful country in the 20th century. My goodness, we had bankruptcies, bear markets, recession, depressions, we had all kinds of problems. That's the way the world works. That's history, that's normal to have setbacks. So China is having and will continue to have and maybe they'll have some horrible setbacks. We, certainly, we the U.S., certainly did. It's, it's normal. So still confident that China will become the number one economy, the dominant uh, superpower? Well, I don't see anybody else out there that's rising like, uh, like China has what been if, rising and has continued to rise. I mean, what it's about like India? going to be... Well, I mean, the Indians love to talk a good game, but so far it's been mainly talk. Uh, Mr. Modi is very popular everywhere he goes, but it's mainly talk so far. Uh, I mean, there's many very, very smart Indians, you know. Uh, It's a wonderful place. If you can only visit one country in your life, I would urge you to go to India. It's an astonishing country. But is it going to be? I mean, that's going to be. It's going to be a great country again someday, but not anytime soon. Not like China. Do you then still believe in people being um, exposed to China's equity markets, to potential investment opportunities in China? Well, yes, I own Chinese shares. It's down. I'm looking for investments in China right now in the stock market. I haven't bought anything recently, but since it's down and there's pessimism, I am looking but I don't have anything yet. Okay, are there any particular sectors in the Chinese equity markets that you think are more interesting than others? Well, I try to find things that are down the most. And so, I mean, things like tourism, travel, entertainment, those are the things that have been hurt badly by the, whatever you want to call it, that's happening in China. So I'm looking for the things that are down, but I don't, I have not bought anything recently. Right. Uh, and yes, the it's been a tough year. The Hang Seng down 10% so far this year. Shanghai Composite Index uh, down, what, 7%. So it's, it's been a tough year for China, but you're saying that this is the moment to start sniffing around for opportunities. I don't know if it's a moment, but I am. And by the way, Hang Seng is Hong Kong. I, 
Well, yeah. that's that's China now, but it's uh, when I consider the Chinese market, I think more of Shanghai and Shenzhen. Yeah, but I uh, certainly know about Hong Kong. Yes, it's a wonderful place. Yeah, the Shenzhen is down, I believe, ten percent uh, year to date. But point point taken there uh, about Hong Kong. Want to get your thoughts, uh, Jim, on Bitcoin? Because you have said in our previous conversations that it's going to be outlawed, that if it really takes off, which it seems like it is, no government is going to tolerate that level of competition. As you know, we've just had 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs approved in the United States. That seemed to indicate more regulatory acceptance of Bitcoin. And to many in the space, it has downgraded the existential threat of the government stepping in and banning Bitcoin. What are your thoughts there? Well, I, my point to be just to clarify is that I don't see cryptocurrencies becoming money because the governments do not want that competition. Yes, we do have Bitcoin is being accepted more and more, but I don't think it's a legitimate currency anywhere yet, except maybe El Salvador, but El Salvador only has 6 million people. So I don't think that's going to change the world. I don't own any cryptocurrencies. I never have. I'm not short any. I've never been short any. Um, I mean, I wish I'd bought it when it was a dollar. I wish I'd bought IBM in 1914. I wish a lot of things, you know, looking back in history. But in my view, just to repeat, and you said it well, if cryptocurrencies become legitimate threats to governments, I don't think most governments are going to accept I don't think the U.S. is going to say, okay, this is money now, but if you want to use that money, you can use their money. You don't have to use our money. That's not the way Washington or London or other places work. So as long as it doesn't sort of interfere in terms of a means of exchange, you think Bitcoin stays out of government crosshairs if it's taken on this sort of store of value kind of role, but isn't actually a, a means of exchange, a currency, even, even though it does have that, that purpose, you think that that well, sort of, go on. But Michelle, silver and gold are traded all over the world and have been for hundreds of years. I don't, well, the US at one time outlawed it, but that's because gold was the currency, was accepted as the currency in those days. So, no, I don't see, as I said, if crypto becomes a threat to governments, to their money, they will probably do something. But so far, it's not a threat. It's just a trading vehicle. Okay. Um, what many people do consider a potential threat to liberty and freedom is the idea of a central bank digital currency. And I know that you have spoken about what we're seeing with the uh, EU won China's version of that. Uh, the People's Bank of China were the first to launch the central bank digital currency idea, which is, of course, a form of fiat currency issued by a country's central bank, allowing the government to see every single transaction. And the currency is also programmable, meaning that the government can decide when the currency works or doesn't work. You've spoken about how you can't get into a taxi and pay for things in cash and that the government monitors your currency in China. What are your thoughts as we're seeing more and more countries move towards developing a CBDC? According to the Atlantic Council, uh, well over 100 countries are in active stages of developing a central bank digital currency. What are your thoughts on that? Well, no, I fully expect that eventually uh, currencies are going to be on the computer. It's much more efficient. It's cheaper. It's better for many people. And governments love it because, as you point out, they know everything you do. They'll call you up one day and say, Michelle, you've been drinking too much coffee this month. Don't drink so much coffee anymore. No, they'll know everything you do. They'll know everything we do. Governments love that. I don't particularly like it. I think it's horrible. But governments have the guns. I don't have any guns. So they will do what they want. And I suspect, and it should happen, that currency money will be on the computer someday. It's not good for you and me, but it's certainly good for the governments. 
So you do see countries moving into a cashless economy? Because cash well, preserves that anonymity. That, yeah. If that's cashless, yes. Yes, yes, yes. If that's your definition of cashless, I certainly think that. I know that will happen because it's not good for you and me to repeat, but it's, they think it's good for them, them They're being on. the government. It's quite terrifying for you and me as viewers of this show know. A central bank digital currency is certainly an issue I'm very concerned about for the reasons that you mentioned, that every transaction can be tracked and that it may not be coffee consumption that the government's upset about, but it could be meat consumption in the sense that I exceed my carbon footprint or my carbon allowance and then my currency doesn't work to purchase that or a plane ticket or whatever the case may be. But you're thinking, I need to get used to this idea because it's inevitable? Well, I don't see how it's not inevitable. Uh, yes, yes, you know, when, when cash, when paper money came along, it was, people didn't think it was inevitable, but historically we can look back and see that it was inevitable. I don't like it, as I say, but I don't see that it's not going to happen because every government in the world likes it, as you point out. Many governments are already working on computer money. They love it. Yeah. So, Jim, give us some positive news. Is there, is there a positive spin that you can put on what's happening in the world right now? I promise you, Michelle, that we're going to have 2025. <laughs> it's, we're going, if we wait long enough, we will have 2025. Yeah, and but, uh, other things. Are we going to be in a bunker in 2025, uh, Jim? I mean, there are billionaires that are building bunkers around the world from um, Zuckerberg to Sam Altman to Peter Thiel. Are we, where are we welcoming 2025? Well, everybody has to make their own decision about that. And as you point out, some are making it in New Zealand. I mean, New Zealand is a nice place, but uh, I don't think I'd want to live there but it's a fantastic country and a lot of people like living there. Uh, I have no idea where to sit out, if the world's gonna come to an end. But Michelle, it's a good time to be an old American because all of these problems that America's going to have in the future, I'm not gonna be around. It's not a good time to be a young American. I have two teenage daughters. Huh? The problems they're going to face in their lifetime are going to be huge. But that's true of every country, especially countries like America. So don't worry. We will have a 2025 and a 2035, and some people will do extremely well. Some will suffer very badly. The key, of course, is to be one of those who does well and not who does badly. And any insights on how you become one of those that does well? Well, the way you become one of those is you stay with what you know. You don't listen to hot tips. You don't listen to hot tips from anywhere, including on the television, including on the computer. If you stay with what you know and put your money and your assets into things that you know a lot about, you will probably be okay. You know, if I told you to buy something, Michelle, and you bought it, and it went up, you wouldn't know what to do. because You don't know why you bought it. If it went down, you wouldn't know what to do. Well, you'd blame me if it went down, <laughs> yes. But you wouldn't know what to do, because you don't know why you bought it in the first place. So if you stay with what you know, you'll, you can come through anything. All right, stay with what you know, but expand your knowledge base so you know more about more things, right? Well, yes, yes, but again, if you're not interested in wheat, you probably, maybe you can expand your knowledge of wheat and maybe you can invest in wheat. But it's usually the p people who are most successful are the people who have a passion about something and they stay with that and that's where they invest when they find new opportunities. And what pearls of wisdom or nuggets of advice are you telling your lovely teenage daughters? That's what I told you, figure out what you love the most. Now, everything I thought when I was 20 was wrong about me, about the world, about everything. So I don't pay too much attention to some of the things they say, because I know they're, 
still too young to really know what they're talking about. Uh, I eventually learned. Uh, everybody, many people eventually learn. So the thing is to figure it, if you can figure out what you love the most, figure it out and pursue that. And that's what I'm trying to teach them. All right. Well, good advice. Stay with what you know. Thank you for sharing some of what you know with us. We know your knowledge is very deep and very wide. So thanks for giving us just a tidbit of that. It's always a pleasure chatting with you, Jim. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Michelle. I mean, as usual, Kit goes on top of things. Well done. Thank All you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Always a pleasure. Bye -bye. See you Rogers. next time. See you soon, bye -bye. Jim. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. And bye -bye. as always, from me, Michelle McQuarrie and the rest of the Kitco News team, thank you so much for watching. And if you are watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to our channel. We'll see you soon.